Act Two of Henry the Sixth, Part One by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Before Orleans. Enter a sergeant of a band with two senators. Sirs, take your places and be vigilant if any noise or soldier you perceive near to the walls by some apparent sign let us have knowledge at the court of guard sergeant you shall exit sergeant thus our poor servitors when others sleep upon their quiet beds constrained to watch in darkness rain and cold enter talbot bedford burgundy and forces with scaling ladders their drums beat a dead march lord regent and redoubted Burgundy, by whose approach the regions of Artois, Wallon, and Picardy are friends to us. This happy night the Frenchmen are secure, having all day caroused and banqueted. Embrace we then this opportunity as fitting best acquittance their deceit, contrived by art and baleful sorcery. Coward of France, how much he wrongs his fame, despairing of his own arm's fortitude, to join with witches and the help of hell. Traitors have never other company. But what's that Purcell of whom they term so pure? A maid, they say. A maid? And be so martial. Pray God she prove not masculine ere long, if underneath the standard of the French she carry armour as she hath begun. Well, let them practise and converse with spirits. God is our fortress, in whose conquering name let us resolve to scale a flinty bulwarks. Ascend, brave Talbot, we will follow thee. Not altogether, better far, I guess, that we do make our entrance several ways. That, if a chance the one of us do fail, the other yet may rise against their force. Agreed. I'll to yond corner. And I to this. And here will Talbot mount, or make his grave. Now, Salisbury, for thee and for the right of English Henry shall this knight appear. How much in duty I am bound to both. Arm, arm, arm. the, the enemy, enemy doth, doth make, make assault. assault. Cry, St. George, a Talbot. The French leap over the walls in their shirts. Enter several ways the bastard of Orleans, Alencion, and Rainier half ready and half unready how now my lords what are unready so unready ay and glad we scaped so well twas time i trow to wake and leave our beds hearing all our rooms at our chamber doors of all exploits since first i followed arms ne'er heard i of a warlike enterprise more venturous or desperate than this i think this talbot be a fiend of hell if not of hell, the heavens sure favour him. Here cometh Charles, I marvel how he sped. Tut! Holy John was his defensive guard. Enter Charles and Joan La Pucelle. Is this thy cunning, thou deceitful dame? Didst thou at first to flatter us withal, make us partakers of a little gain, that now our loss might be ten times so much? Wherefore is Charles impatient with his friend? At all times, will you have my power alike? Sleeping or waking, must I still prevail, or will you blame and lay the fault on me? Improvident soldiers, had your watch been good, this sudden mischief never could have fallen. Duke of Alencon, this was your default, that being captain of the watch tonight, did look no better to that weighty charge? Had all your quarters been as safely kept as that whereof I had the government, we had not been thus shamefully surprised. Mine was secure. And so was mine, my lord. And for myself, most part of all this night within her quarter and mine own precinct, I was employed in passing to and fro about relieving of the sentinels. Then how or which way should they first break in? Question, my lords, no further of the case. How or which way? Tis sure they found some place but weakly guarded, where the breach was made. And now there rests no other shift but this, to gather our soldiers, scattered and dispersed, 
and lay new platforms to endamage them. Alarum. Enter an English soldier, crying, A Talbot, a Talbot. They fly, leaving their clothes behind. I'll be so bold to take what they have left. The cry of Talbot serves me for a sword, for I have loaded me with many spoils, using no other weapon but his name. Exit. Scene two. Orleans. Within the town. Enter Talbot. Bedford, Burgundy, a captain, and others. The day begins to break, and night is fled, whose pitchy mantle overveiled the earth. Here sound retreat, and cease our hot pursuit. Retreat sounded. Bring forth the body of old Salisbury, and here advance it in the market place, the middle centre of this cursed town. Now have I paid my vow unto his soul, for every drop of blood was drawn from him. There hath at least five Frenchmen died tonight and that hereafter ages may behold what ruin happened in revenge of him within the chiefest temple i'll erect the tomb wherein his corpse shall be interred upon the which that ever one may read shall be engraved the sack of orleans the treacherous manner of his mournful death and what a terror he had been to france but lords in all our bloody massacre i muse we met not with the Dauphin's grace, his new-found champion, virtuous John of Arc, nor any of his false confederates. Tis thought, Lord Talbot, when the fight began, roused on the sudden from their drowsy beds, they did amongst the troops of armed men leap o'er the walls for refuge in the field. Myself, as far as I could well discern for smoke and dusky vapours of the night, am sure I scared the Dolphin and his trull, when arm in arm they both came swiftly running, like to a pair of loving turtle-doves that could not live a Sunday day or night. After that, things are set in order here. We'll follow them with all the power we have. Enter a messenger. All hail, my lords. Which of this princely train call ye the warlike Talbot, for his act so much applauded through the realm of France? Here is the Talbot. Who would speak with him? The virtuous lady, Countess of Auvergne, with modesty admiring thy renown, by me entreats, great lord, thou wouldst vouchsafe to visit her poor castle where she lies, that she may boast she hath beheld the man whose glory fills the world with loud report. Is it even so? Nay, then, I see our wars will turn into a peaceful comic sport, when ladies crave to be encountered with. You may not, my lord, despise her gentle suit. Nay, trust me, then, for when a world of men could not prevail with all their oratory, yet hath a woman's kindness overruled and therefore tell her i return great thanks and in submission will attend on her will not your honours bear me company no truly it is more than manners will and i have heard it said unbidden guests are often welcomest when they are gone well then alone since there's no remedy i mean to prove this lady's courtesy come hither captain Whispers. You perceive my mind. I do, my lord, and mean accordingly. Exeunt. Scene three. Avernier. The Countess's castle. Enter the Countess and her porter. Porter, remember what I gave in charge, and when you have done so, bring the keys to me. Madam, I will. Exit. The plot is laid. If all things fall out right, I shall as famous be by this exploit, as Scythian Tomris by Cyrus's death. Great is the rumour of this dreadful night, and his achievements of no less account. Fain would mine eyes be witnessed with mine ears, to give their censure of these rare reports. Enter messenger and Talbot. Madam, according as your ladyship desired, by message craved, so is Lord Talbot come. And he is welcome. What? Is this the man? Madam, it is. Is this the scourge of France? Is this the Talbot so much feared abroad, that with his name the mothers still their babes? I see report as fabulous and false. I thought I should have seen some Hercules, a second Hector, for his grim aspect, and large proportions of his strong-knit limbs. Alas, this is a child, a silly dwarf. It cannot be this weak and riddled shrimp should strike such terror to his enemies. Madam, I have been bold to trouble you, 
but since your ladyship is not at leisure, I'll sort some other time to visit you. What means he now? Go ask him whither he goes. Stay, my lord Talbot, for my lady craves to know the cause of your abrupt departure. Marry, for that she's in a wrong belief, or I go to certify her Talbot's here. Re-enter porter with keys. If thou be he, then art thou prisoner. Prisoner? To whom? To me, bloodthirsty lord, and for that cause I train thee to my house. Long time thy shadow hath been thrall to me, for in my gallery thy picture hangs. But now the substance shall endure the like, and I will chain these legs and arms of thine, that hast by tyranny these many years, wasted our country, slain our citizens, and sent our sons and husbands captivate. <laughs> Laughest thou, wretch, thy mirth shall turn to moan. I laugh to see your ladyship so fond, to think that you have aught but Talbot's shadow, whereon to practice your severity. Why, art not thou the man? I am indeed. Then have I substance, too? No, no, I am but the shadow of myself. You are deceived, my substance is not here what you see is but the smallest part and least proportion of humanity i tell you madam were the whole frame here it is of such spacious lofty pitch your roof were not sufficient to contain it this is a riddling merchant for the nonce he will be here and yet he is not here how can these contrarieties agree that will i show you presently winds his horn drums strike up Appeal of ordinance. Enter soldiers. I'll see you, madam. Are you now persuaded that Talbot is but shadow of himself? These are his substance, sinews, arms, and strength, with which he yoketh your rebellious necks, raiseth your cities, and subverts your towns, and in a moment makes them desolate. Victorious Talbot, pardon my abuse. I find thou art no less than fame hath bruited, and more than may be gathered by thy shape. Let my presumption not provoke thy wrath, for I am sorry that with reverence I did not entertain thee as thou art. Be not dismayed, fair lady, nor misconstrue the mind of Talbot, as you did mistake the outward composition of his body. What you have done hath not offended me, no other satisfaction do I crave, but only with your patience, that we may taste of your wine, and see what cakes you have, for soldiers' stomachs always serve them well. With all my heart, and think me honoured to feast so great a warrior in my house. Exalt. Scene four, London. The Temple Garden. Enter the Earls of Somerset, Suffolk, and Warwick, Richard Plantagenet, Vernon, and another lawyer. Great lords and gentlemen, what means this silence? Dare no man answer in a case of truth? Within the temple wall we were too loud. The garden here is more convenient. Then say at once, if I maintained the truth, or else was wrangling Somerset in the error. Faith, I have been a truant in the law, and never yet could frame my will to it, and therefore frame the law unto my will. Judge you, my lord of Warwick, then, between us. Between two hawks, which flies the higher pitch? Between two dogs, which hath the deeper mouth? Between two blades, which bears the better temper? Between two horses, which doth bear him best? Between two girls, which hath the merriest eye? I have perhaps some shallow spirit of judgment, but in these nice sharp quillets of the law, good faith, I am no wiser than a daw. Tut, tut, here is a mannerly forbearance. The truth appears so naked on my side that any purblind eye may find it out. And on my side it is so well apparelled, so clear, so shining, and so evident that it will glimmer through a blind man's eye. Since you are tongue-tied and so loath to speak, in dumb significance proclaim your thoughts. Let him that is a true-born gentleman and stands upon the honour of his birth, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. I love no colours, and without all colour of base insinuating flattery, I pluck this white rose with Plantagenet. 
I pluck this red rose with young Somerset, and say with all I think he held the right. Stay, lords and gentlemen, and pluck no more, till you conclude that he upon whose side the fewest roses are cropped from the tree shall yield the other in the right opinion. Good Master Vernon, it is well objected. If I have fewest, I subscribe in silence. And I. Then, for the truth and plainness of the case, I pluck this pale and maiden blossom here, giving my verdict on the white rose side. Break not your finger as you pluck it off, lest bleeding you do paint the white rose red, and fall on my side so against your will. If I, my lord, for my opinion bleed, opinion shall be surgeon to my hurt, and keep me on the side where still I am. Well, well, come on, who else? Unless my study and my books be false, the argument to be held was wrong in you. To Somerset. In sign whereof, I pluck a white rose too. Now, Somerset, where is your argument? Here in my scabbard, meditating that shall dye your white rose in a bloody red. Meantime, your cheeks do counterfeit our roses, for pale they look with fear as witnessing the truth on our side. No, Plantagenet, tis not for fear, but anger thy cheeks blush for pure shame to counterfeit our roses, and yet thy tongue will not confess thy error. Hath not thy rose a canker, Somerset? Hath not thy rose a thorn, Plantagenet? Ay, sharp and piercing, to maintain his truth, whilst thy consuming canker eats his falsehood. Well, I'll find friends to wear my bleeding roses that shall maintain what I have said is true, where false Plantagenet dare not be seen. Now by this maiden blossom in my hand I scorn thee and thy fashion, peevish boy. Turn not thy scorns this way, Plantagenet. Proud Pole, I will, and scorn both him and thee. I'll turn my part thereof into thy throat. Away, away, good William de la Pole. We grace the yeoman by conversing with him. Now, by God's will, thou wrongest him, Somerset. His grandfather was Lionel, Duke of Clarence, third son to the third Edward, King of England. Spring crestless yeoman from so deep a root? He bears him on the place's privilege, or durst not for his craven heart say thus. By him that made me, I'll maintain my words on any plot of ground in Christendom. Was not thy father, Richard Earl of Cambridge, for treason executed in our late king's days? And by his treason stand'st not thou attained, corrupted and exempt from ancient gentry? His trespass yet lives guiltly in thy blood, and till thou be restored, thou art a yeoman my father was attached not attainted condemned to die for treason but no traitor and that i'll prove on better men than somerset were growing time once ripened to my will for your partaker pole and you yourself i'll note you in my book of memory to scourge you for this apprehension look to it well and say you are well warned ah thou shalt find us ready for thee still and knowest by these colours for thy foes for these my friends in spite of thee shall wear and by my soul this pale and angry rose as cognizance of my blood-drinking hate will i for ever and my faction wear until it wither with me to my grave or flourish to the height of my degree go forward and be choked with thy ambition and so farewell until I meet thee next. Exit. Have with thee, Pole. Farewell, ambitious Richard. Exit. How I am braved, and must perforce endure it. This blot that they object against your house shall be wiped out in the next Parliament called for the truce of Winchester and Gloucester. And if thou be not then created York, I will not live to be accounted Warwick. Meantime, in signal of my love to thee, Against proud Somerset and William Pole, will I upon thy party wear this rose. And here I prophesy, this brawl to-day, grown to this faction in the temple garden, shall send between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death and deadly night. Good Master Vernon, I am bound to you, that you on my behalf would pluck a flower. In your behalf, still I will wear the same. And so will I. Thanks, gentle sir. 
Come, let us for to dinner. I dare say this quarrel will drink blood another day. Exeunt. Scene five, the Tower of London. Enter Mortimer, brought in a chair, and jailers. Kind keepers of my weak decaying age, let dying Mortimer here rest himself. Even like a man new haled from the rack, so fare my limbs with long imprisonment. And these gray locks, the pursuivants of death, nestor like aged in an age of care, argue the end of Edmund Mortimer. These eyes, like lamps whose wasting oil is spent, wax dim as drawing to their exigent. Weak shoulders, overborne with burthening grief, and pithless arms, like to a withered vine that droops his sapless branches to the ground. Yet are these feet, whose strengthless stay is numb, unable to support this lump of clay, swift-winged with desire to get a grave, as witting I no other comfort have. But tell me, keeper, will my nephew come? Richard Plantagenet, my lord, will come. We sent unto the temple, unto his chamber. An answer was returned that he will come. Enough. My soul shall then be satisfied. Poor gentleman, his wrong doth equal mine. Since Henry Monmouth first began to reign, before whose glory I was great in arms, this loathsome sequestration have I had, and even since then hath Richard been obscured deprived of honour and inheritance but now the arbitrator of despairs just death kind umpire of men's miseries with sweet enlargement doth dismiss me hence i would his troubles likewise were expired that so he might recover what was lost enter richard plantagenet my lord your loving nephew now is come Richard Plantagenet, my friend, is he come? I, noble uncle, thus ignobly used. Your nephew, late despised Richard, comes. Direct mine arms I may embrace his neck, and in his bosom spend my latter gasp. Oh, tell me when my lips do touch his cheeks, that I may kindly give one fainting kiss. And now declare, sweet stem from York's great stock, why didst thou say of late thou wert despised first lean thine aged back against mine arm and in that ease i'll tell thee my dis-ease this day in argument upon a case some words there grew twixt somerset and me among which terms he used his lavish tongue and did upbraid me with my father's death which obloquy set bars before my tongue else with the like i had requited him Therefore, good uncle, for my father's sake, in honour of a true Plantagenet, and for alliance's sake, declare the cause my father, Earl of Cambridge, lost his head. That cause, fair nephew, that imprisoned me, and hath detained me all my flowering youth within a loathsome dungeon there to pine, was cursed instrument of his decease. Discover more at large what cause that was, for I am ignorant and cannot guess. I will, if that my fading breath permit, and death approach not ere my tale be done. Henry the Fourth, grandfather to this king, deposed his nephew Richard, Edward's son, the first begotten and the lawful heir of Edward King, the third of that descent, during whose reign the Percies of the North, finding his usurpation most unjust, endeavoured my advancement to the throne the reason moved these warlike lords to this was for that young king richard thus removed leaving no heir begotten of his body i was the next by birth and parentage for by my mother i derived am from lionel duke of clarence the third son to king edward the third whereas he from john of gaunt doth bring his pedigree being but fourth of that heroic line but mark as in this haughty attempt they laboured to plant the rightful heir 
I lost my liberty, and they their lives. Long after this, when Henry V, succeeding his father Bolingbroke, did reign, thy father, Earl of Cambridge, then derived from famous Edmund Langley, Duke of York, marrying my sister, that thy mother was, again in pity of my hard distress, levied an army, weaning to redeem and have installed me in the diadem. But, as the rest, so fell that noble earl, and was beheaded. Thus the Mortimers, in whom the tide rested, were suppressed. Of which, my lord, your honour is the last. True, and thou seest that I no issue have, and that my fainting words do warrant death thou art my heir the rest i wish thee gather but yet be wary in thy studious care thy grave admonishments prevail with me but yet methinks my father's execution was nothing less than bloody tyranny with silence nephew be thou politic strong fixed is the house of lancaster and like a mountain not to be removed but now thy uncle is removing hence, as princes do their courts when they are cloyed with long continuance in a settled place. O oh, uncle, would some part of my young years might but redeem the passage of your age. Thou dost then wrong me as that slaughterer doth, which giveth many wounds when one will kill. Mourn not, except thou sorrow for my good, only give order for my funeral and so farewell and fair be all thy hopes and prosperous be thy life in peace and war dies and peace no war befall thy parting soul in prison hast thou spent a pilgrimage and like a hermit overpassed thy days well i will lock his counsel in my breast and what i do imagine let that rest keepers convey him hence and i myself will see his burial better than his life exeunt jailers bearing out the body of mortimer here dies the dusky torch of mortimer choked with ambition of the meaner sort and for those wrongs those bitter injuries which somerset hath offered to my house i doubt not but with honour to redress and therefore haste I to the Parliament, either to be restored to my blood, or make my ill the advantage of my good. Exit. End of Act Two.